Uh, our next speaker is uh, Jeremy Waite from Salesforce, uh, who was named, I think, the most influential person on Twitter in 2015 by uh, Onalytica. He's here to tell us what it means for you and your business. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for Jeremy Waite. How are we doing, everybody? Head's blown already. This room's a bit big, isn't it? They said you've got a little breakout session. It's like freaking huge. Um, and only one Apple Watch in the room. That's amazing. Um, so you've got me till 12 o'clock. I'm going to try and talk about a lot of different things. And you're going to hear some talk shortly as well about all of the different types of Internet of Things and what that means. I'm going to try and explain kind of my take on that. But I'm not going to dig into all of these different products. I think we could talk all day long about different connected things and what they do. And isn't this interesting? This is a new thing that's come out. You guys can go and read Wired for that. So I thought it'd be interesting to talk about the bigger conversation around that. You know, Michael Dell said, ideas are commodity, but execution of them is not. There's lots and lots of ideas, but what does it mean when we actually look at some of these technologies? So I'm going to look at some of the biggest companies in the world and how they're using the Internet of Things. I believe there's also an issue that we don't pay enough attention to around humans. I don't think we have technology problems. I believe we had people problems. This is my first connected product, if you're wondering what's in my hands. And all of you youngsters on the front have no idea what that is. This is my VIC-20. This is um, from 1983. I learned to program this thing. Um, if every single person in Wales had five of those, there would still be more technology in my iPhone. And yet this is from 1983. We had 3.5K RAM. It's just ridiculous, the, the way that things have come on. So we're going to talk a lot about data. We're going to talk about Internet of Things and what that means. If you don't know who I am, um, I work for a little cloud company that you may have heard of, Salesforce. We're the biggest cloud company in the world. We're the fastest growing enterprise software company in the world at the moment. And we've been voted by Forbes magazine the most innovative company in the world for the last four years. That's not necessarily because of what we do. That's because of what our customers do with our technology. So I'm going to try and give you a little bit of a behind the scenes on what that looks like and how some of our customers like Uber and GE and Philips are making hundreds of billions of dollars just from connecting stuff faster than anybody else. Does that sound OK? So we've got 20 minutes. It's going to be fast. I'm going to do something that I normally don't do as well. All of these slides are going to be on SlideShare. So I'll put the address at the end. But if you want to go on slideshare.net slash Jeremy Way, you're welcome to download the whole thing because there's going to be a bunch of stuff that you may have missed. But this isn't a deeply technical conversation either because I think there's some big topics. At conferences like this, we remember the smallest amount. And I think there's some big fundamental issues that it's too easy for us to miss. And I think this speaks to one of them, my friend Nate Silver. Data scientist wrote the signal and the noise. We rely too much on technology, not enough on ourselves. We think all these technologies are going to solve all of our problems, but often they don't. They sit in a corner flashing. So exactly what does that mean? Well, if we think about the Internet of Things, this is the slide that you would probably normally expect to see at a conference like this. It's all the connected everything from a toothbrush and a Fitbit. I'm a huge fan of Microsoft. Um, Dave can give me some money later if he's in the room. Um, the Microsoft Band, which is probably one of the best wearables. I'm a big believer that just because you can connect everything doesn't mean that you should. Apple Watch is amazing. I think it does too much. If you actually time it, it's physically faster to use a phone than it is to use a watch. For any of your friends that have got one, try it in a pub. Connected toothbrushes. We've got connected fridges. We've got wind farms, and we've got cars. The Internet of Things, this is the easiest way to think about it. We had the web, and we had the dot-com bust, and then everything went down, and everybody was incredibly depressed. And then people started looking towards, well, how do we build user-generated content? How do we engage a community through connected things, through the Internet, which is incredibly slow when we started off? And people started connecting on things, and stuff got faster and faster and faster. But what ended up happening was, as we connected devices, these devices started to talk to each other. So if you think about a Nest, Google didn't buy Nest because it's this beautifully advanced technology that lives in your house and is your thermostat. They built Nest because that's going to be the ecosystem for your house. It's so deeply rooted in all the technology behind it. So the key to the Internet of Things is how these technologies talk to each other and all the data that we can pull off of that. That's where the huge value exchange is. Because when these products are connected, the world is transformed by the data that comes off of them. So exactly what does that mean? How could we look into that? Well, this is our jobs. doesn't matter 
who we are, what our title is. It doesn't matter what technology. A lot of you guys are looking to build out some new stuff. I'm going to try and give you some examples about how you should go back to the office tomorrow, try and build for the Internet of Things, and maybe give you some advice about what not to do. But all it really ever comes down to is we need to take someone from unknown to known. We know nothing about our customers. We can somehow provide a value exchange, and then they give us some information, and we can do useful things with it. We do that, for example, with Live Nation, from connecting devices to connecting apps, connecting venues, connecting sound systems, and everything across the social web and the Internet. Live Nation is the biggest database of event management information in the world. They track about 4,000 things about their customers. 4,000 things. That's how they can give someone exactly the right message at exactly the right time, because they're joining up all of that data. And that's going to be the theme for the next 15 minutes or so. How do we make sense of all of this data in a way that we can filter it out? Because whoever filters faster than anyone else, they're the ones that are going to win. But if that value exchange isn't clear enough, and we have maybe slightly more unethical business models, and we're going to look at that shortly as well, then that's where we fall over. And we need to make sure that the value that we create exceeds the value that we capture. If anyone's tweeting in a room, that's probably a good tweet. The value that we create exceeds the value that we capture. There's some companies that you guys will know very well that are not doing a good job of that at the moment. So you'd probably see some explosion like that as well. We'd look at the internet of everything. Fantastic. You've seen a million charts. It's all really dull, but you know, it's going to show there's lots more stuff being connected. You know, the revenue from the internet of things is going to be 10 times bigger over the next five years. It's fascinating stuff, but let me try and give this a little bit more context. I prefer this. This is essentially what we're trying to do, isn't it? We're trying to take knowledge. We're trying to take all the data from every device from every channel, from every ecosystem, not, ne not necessarily our own, and we're trying to connect it in a way that provides a valuable experience. I'm going to show you a short video of someone that tried to do exactly that, and this is beautiful. This wasn't planned, but this is 11 years ago to the day that this interview was given. It's about 90 seconds long. It's somebody who wanted to connect the world, and they believed that if they could make it more open and connected, the world would be a much better place. And they weren't driven by money, despite the misconceptions of what a lot of you guys may think. You can probably all guess who I'm talking about. Just watch this for 90 seconds, and then we'll have a chat about it. Meeting people online, it's commonplace for those looking for love, friendship, or networking, perhaps to find a job. And now there's a new form of cyber matchmaking, college networking websites. Is this perhaps the next big thing? In Watertown, Massachusetts, Mark Zuckerberg, creator of, creator of Harvard's thefacebook.com. Mark... If somebody was to put the question to you about the, the magnitude of what you think you've launched, how big do you think your product or your service is? Well, it's impossible to tell. When we first launched, we were hoping for, you know, maybe 400, 500 people. Harvard didn't have a Facebook, so that's the gap that we were trying to fill. And now we're at 100,000 people, so who knows where we're going next. Um, we're hoping to have many more universities by the fall, hopefully over 100 or 200. And from there, we're going to launch a bunch of site applications, which should keep people coming back to the site and maybe could make something cool. What is the Facebook exactly? It's an online directory that connects people through universities and colleges through their social networks there. You sign on, you make a profile about yourself by answering some questions, entering some information, such as your concentration or major at school, um, contact information about phone numbers, instant messaging, screen names, anything you want to tell, interests, what books you like, movies, and most importantly, who your friends are. And then you can browse around and... So that's interesting. Right? I just wanted that to play a little longer because there's, there's a couple of things in that that are really important. First of all, he only expected a couple of hundred people, right? And then maybe two or three hundred universities and a couple of thousand. He had no idea. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, we all think that he's driven by money and he's trying to get us to click more ads. He is genuinely vision, uh, driven by a vision to connect the rest of the world, which is why internet.org exists. To connect the other two-thirds of the world makes no commercial sense for the next 20 or 30 years. But if you can connect all of those devices and provide more valuable experiences for farmers and for education systems, Facebook's driving all that forward. He was in his dorm room when this was only six weeks old and he was offered 10 million pounds. Pounds. 10 million pounds, you think you're a student and you've got no money and he turned it down. Then he was offered 500,000 and then he was offered a million and five million then eventually he was offered one billion and 10 billion and he still turned them all down because he believed that when more people are connected, we can do more wonderful things. And I think we get too seduced by the technology part of it. 
You know, Facebook blew up when it opened up its platform and people could start building on top of it. It was one of the most profound things that Facebook did. And they were nervous to do that at the beginning because they, they were precious about it. But they understood that people saw that if you can connect devices and you've got 140 friends, within one click, you're going to reach 19,600 people. And one more click, you reach 2.7 million people. That's the scale of the Internet of Humans or the Internet of Things. You know, we shouldn't get kind of locked in by these thinking about, well, we've just got to build on an app and how do we do that? We kind of miss the value creation as we're trying to build out stuff faster because we're trying to make more money. We need to make sure we've got a good intent and a good purpose before we do that. I thought it was interesting as well, by the way, that you notice when he said at the beginning that one line when he said, what exactly do you do? You know, this is when it was months old. He knew exactly what he did in one line. A lot of us probably would struggle to do that. When people say, what's your company? Why is it different? How are you going to take over in the next five years? What's the one thing that makes you special? What's your purpose? What's your mission? It's something worth thinking about because it's not what the software does. It's what the user does. Let me give this some context. Um, could we turn the sound down on this because I just wanted to talk over it because we're going to be short of time. This is a video, hopefully, of connected products. Is this not playing for a reason, guys? Perfect. Um, connected products, this is a connected seagull. <laughs> we can connect everything, doesn't mean that we should. If you think about all the data that's coming off the social web at the moment, or the internet of things, all the connected products, 90% of all that data didn't even exist 12 months ago. It's growing at a rate of about two and a half quintillion bytes a day, which if you think about that, that's scientific terms, that's 18 zeros. That's actually a company the size of Google being created every four days. That's all the information you imagine is coming from a Nest, from Google Maps, from all their connected devices. All of that is being recreated at scale every four days. It's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Digital universe is going to be 10 times bigger over the next two years. It's going to be 40 times bigger over the next five years. It's our job to make sense of that. Whoever can filter out all of this noise faster than their competitors, they're the ones that are going to win. Not the ones with the sexiest app. We talk a lot about innovation, didn't we, and invention on the panel. And I think sometimes we forget because just things are getting faster and faster and faster and we get nervous because we don't sometimes provide enough value. Let me give you some more context. Look at this. This is the trading floor of UBS. This is a thousand connected devices. This is UBS who claim at Canary Wharf down the road in London. They claim that if they can be two thousandth of a second faster than their competitors just by connecting products faster through fiber optic, they make an extra $20 billion per year just the difference between two commodity exchanges before the price updates in one commodity exchange to another between Chicago and New York. $20 billion a year just from being a couple of thousandth of a second faster. It's absolutely insane. And there was some research that was done about it just a couple of years after Sir so Tim gave us a World Wide Web, and they were looking at 20 years ago, 1995, the average amount of time that people held shares in a company was four years, and today it's 22 seconds. Now, why is that interesting? What's this got to do with the Internet of Things? We're talking about speed. We're talking about connected products. If you think that an interest in a company is the same as a share, people aren't interested in companies very long anymore, but yet that's our job. Our job is to go out and to reach customers faster and build relationships faster. My boss, Mark Benioff, says companies are no longer competing against each other. They're competing against speed, and yet often we're in the weeds doing competitive analysis all the time. We're going to look at a couple of examples of that shortly, but let me just remind you that this isn't all beautiful. Obviously, the world's exploding. There's phenomenal revenue opportunities for all to go out and to do you know, wonderful things. People are building apps all day long, but they're not looking at the ecosystem. 60% of all the apps in the App Store have never been downloaded, ever, not even once. People think it's going to go and change the world. And one of the reasons is because of this, because trust is the biggest problem in technology. That as we go out and we try and build these things and we try and connect all these networks, if we don't provide a big enough value exchange, there's a danger that we're going to go the same way as the banking industry, like we just saw with UBS does, that there could be a crash because that trust exchange isn't big enough. In fact, Edelman looked at this last year and they found that 2015 was going to be the year that had the widest gap of trust between consumers, businesses and brands. Harvard had a look at it. And they found that, you know what, only 23% of customers think they've got a relationship with a company or a brand or an app or an ecosystem. There's an opportunity in the 23%, but there's a huge problem that we're out here trying to build relationships and trying to build them faster. 
Even Kevin Spacey was talking about this recently with his Netflix, and he was saying that our job, no matter what our title is, doesn't matter who we work for or what we do, our only job is to tell better stories. That's it. Doesn't matter what we do, our only job is to tell better stories. We've got to remember that our audience is the most compelling part of that story, the most important part, and our job is to tell those stories as fast and as compellingly as possible. Now, how do you do that when people's attention spans are only five seconds? And they're telling stories at the speed of a swipe. And you've got to make sure that you've got exactly the right message at exactly the right time, no matter what product it is you're trying to connect. Because if you lost someone in the five seconds, then it's gone. How do we do that? Let's look at a couple of examples. I know you've all seen this before. We mentioned Facebook, the world's largest content provider that doesn't own any content whatsoever. The world's largest e-commerce company in the world, Alibaba, owns no inventory whatsoever. One day at the end of last year, it did $9 billion in one day. World's largest accommodation provider owns no real estate, and of course, we've got the fastest growing company in the world, Uber, that owns no cars. In fact, I interviewed the GM of Uber last year, and I said, what is it that you're doing so fast? You're the fastest growing company in the world, 50,000 jobs a month, valued at 40 billion, most likely to 800 billion. He said, we're not a car services company, we're a financial services brand. And he started to play out this concept that they've got of how they're trying to get value from data. From every time someone logs in, every mobile, every email. How can they put all of that together? Now, the issue, obviously, that Uber has got is that there's a, a value exchange of a bit of a discrepancy because perhaps their business model isn't quite as ethical as it should be. So I thought, well, let's have a look at it because we don't do this very often. We're talking about the Internet of Things. We make the mistake in thinking that some of these incredible technologies that are worth absolute fortunes are all unique technology, and Uber's not at all. So they've built out an ecosystem. It's a fantastic service. You know, morally, they're doing the right thing. They genuinely want to add value to people's lives, but ethically, it's very, very gray in the way that they do that. Commission price is going up, and there's too many drivers on the road, so the drivers are perhaps not getting the best experience. But you know, dispatch, they do, but you look at all the maps. You know, Bing, Apple, Google Maps. That's not Uber technology. Salesforce is powering a lot of the messages behind it, and the marketing messages and email. You've got companies like Twilo that are doing voice and the messages and the text that you receive when you get the Uber app on your phone, and even the payment systems are managed by Braintree. It's just an ecosystem that they've just plugged together with a very thin technology layer. We ask too much of technology, not enough of ourselves. Uber at the moment has got so seduced with the technology and the growth that that's in danger of maybe going down. It could be an AOL. And we've got to be very careful as we start to build out things that the same fate does not become us. And one of my favorite people in the world, Avanash, who you should follow on Google if you've not already, it's all of this stuff, all of this stuff is powerful, but it's how we will use it defines us. We forget what a big responsibility we have with access to all this data. All the data from the beginning of time till 2003 is now created every 24 hours. It's our jobs to try and make sense of that. Obviously, there's huge opportunities in how we can do that. But we kind of forget about the ethical side of it. Let me just come to a close with a couple of examples. We have five minutes. These are four of my favorite companies. Do you think about the Internet of Things? This is the industrial Internet of Things. We've got IBM's Watson at the top. The big supercomputer that is most likely to find the cure for cancer, I believe, because they've got all the data records, everything that's coming in from patient records, from all the treatment systems that they've got, historical behavior going all the way back. And they've also put in the entire archive of Wikipedia, the New York Times, millions and millions, tens of millions of the most popular blogs on the Internet. And they've now got machine learning capabilities that are learning how to solve problems. Philips are doing the same at the bottom. They're connecting MRI scanners and hospitals. They're finding cures for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So the Internet of Things. I'm going to show you one slide in a second that shows how you can do this with exactly what it is that you're doing. This is fascinating stuff. Volvo claimed that by the end of 2017, they're connected cars. You think safety isn't sexy? Volvo claimed by the end of 2017, it'll be the first car that no one in the world is killed or seriously injured by. That's their mission. Philips want to improve the lives of 3 billion people by 2025. General Electric is trying to improve logistic systems and transportations across America, and they found out that if they can use data to help a train be more efficient and go just one mile an hour faster, it's going to make an extra $200 million for the providers. This is just connected products. This isn't just dashboards and Teslas and bands. This isn't just Apple Watches. You know, how are we going to do this to provide genuinely life-changing, mind-blowing experiences for the customers that we're here to serve? 
Well, that's easy. We all say that. It's a cliche. We can throw that away at conferences. But exactly how do we think big and start small? Well, the first piece of advice, read this, if you've not read it already. Peter Thiel, uh, the first original outside investor in Facebook, the founder of PayPal. He's from Sequoia, one of the big VCs in the Valley. He talks about the quickest way to fail is to get 1% of a billion dollar market. The quickest way to fail is to get 1% of a billion dollar market. We need to innovate faster. We should be looking for a monopoly. We shouldn't be going out to try and get a small slice. And there's obviously outliers we just heard from Pow Wow Now. It's not about who has the idea first, it's often who has the idea best. So obviously this isn't consistent across everybody, but it's a fantastic book about how we should innovate from zero to one, not innovate sideways, just by doing stuff a tiny bit better than everybody else. Marginal gains is going to kill you, because you've not got the money or the runway probably to see all of that through. So we used to work with brands like Dell. They have this idea, don't be the best in the world at what you do, be the only one at what you do. They've tried to reinvent the way that they're managing things. They've bought some technologies for most. They only measure five things. They say, if we want to build connected products that provide the best experiences, we only want to measure five things. This is one of the takeaways for today. Who are my customers? What did they say? When did they say those things? Why did the conversations take place and where? Demographic information. What platform was it on? Where should I split my time, money, and resources? Who's saying what and why? What are the trends? And how can we use predictive analytics from big data to figure out where? They're going to go next based upon where they've been in the past. It's not rocket science. I know we've only got 20 minutes. So I'd love to dig into this a little bit more, but we don't have time. They've got command centers that they've built, tracking sales and marketing and service and connected products all in one place just so they can innovate faster. Brands like General Electric now, they're finding out that if they can surface their data one second um, instead of the 30 days it used to take them, they've got their data analytics on their phone and their wrists. They're making an extra $256 billion a year by pulling in connected data from a jet engine to figure out exactly how it stays in the air longer, and they can predict exactly when it needs to be serviced. $256 billion a year over five years just from connecting data faster. We're going from this to running our business from our watches to running our businesses from our phones. So last takeaway, this is how we do this. This is how Uber work, this is how Dell work, this is how we look at Zynga and Rovio, we look at Philips, connected toothbrushes, we look at connected fridges. There's only four things that we need to do and there's only four components to how we do it. And you can get these from SlideShare as well later on, but I'll just show you really quick. This is all the Internet of Things is, and we could almost talk about this is all big data is. We make it incredibly complicated and we really shouldn't. All we're doing is joining the dots between those four things. All the customers that we know and all of our prospects and employees, everything from the connected web, no matter where that comes from, and the web, just like Salesforce, is just a platform. The internet's an operating system just full of hundreds and hundreds of APIs, like we've seen with Uber. How do we build on that? How do we tie that with purchase data? 37% of executives have no idea what the lifetime value is of their customers, and they've got no idea what to invest to get them, to keep them, to sustain them, and to build out new stuff. Social data, 550 million blogs and forums now. And if you ask any data scientist, they say what we've just spoke about over the last 18, 19 minutes. How much is there? How fast is it going? How many different types? And most importantly, veracity, is it accurate? That's our jobs. That's what we need to do. And we need to do that by looking at who, what, why, where, and when. It's very scary. It's moving incredibly fast. We shouldn't worry about it, even though apparently According to PwC, 80% of executives feel overwhelmed and underprepared for the challenges they're going to face over the next five years. How do we innovate faster? I believe we innovate faster by building things that matter, not just because we can get some quick data and we can try and sell it fast. Does that make sense? Some big topics I think we need to think about. Trust, how we manage data, how we provide enough value. We create more value than we capture. Thank you very much. You can, you can get it all in SlideShare. Feel free to, to download it. And thanks for your time. I really appreciate it.